Hey guys, Speculative Sandbox now has a shop. Treat yourself with graphic tees, tanks, stickers, and notebooks. Check out the podcast notes for a link, and don't forget to use the promo code SANDBOX to get 20% off. People were saying things, especially around self-driving cars. People were saying things like, oh, you know, all the truckers will be out of work, but not me. My job is creative. No one could do what I could do, right? <laughs> and uh, I think that more and more we're seeing that, you know, there are very few jobs that are off limits to uh, this sort of technology. Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicki Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. The technological singularity is a hypothetical point in time at which technological growth will become radically faster and uncontrollable, resulting in unforeseeable changes to human civilization. With the advent of artificial intelligence driving our cars and generating never-before-seen images from prompts, how close are we to a technological singularity? Author Neil Holtschulte joins the podcast to help answer that question. Can we recognize self-awareness in computers? And what does it mean for us when we do? All right. So, Neil, thank you so much for joining me on Speculative Sandbox today. Please tell me about yourself and your latest projects. Yeah. So my name is Neil Holtschulte. Um, I'm an aspiring author, although I guess when this... Uh, airs. Uh, hopefully by then my novel will be out. It should be out in early October. October. Uh, the novel is titled Crew of Exiles. So uh, that's in the works. That's well done and you know just needs to be put out there. And I'm working on some other novels. Uh, by day I am a uh, computer science instructor. I teach at uh, CNM which is Central New Mexico Community College in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I have a wonderful dog, as I just showed off on the Zoom, although the podcast can't see it. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Very cool. So we kind of connected, I believe, on Twitter. And yes. you had an interest in talking about technological singularity, which right away sounds super science fiction, especially for those that are unfamiliar with the tech term. So that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about today. In plain English, how would you define it? So... <laughs> perhaps not entirely my words because I looked up some ways that different people do define it but as briefly as I can say it is a point in time hypothetical point in time at which the acceleration of technology uh, increases at such an exponential rate that everything beyond that it, it, all predictions are off and specifically it, it's almost always talking about some form of artificial intelligence or, you know, uploading our brains into the cloud, like in the matrix, something in that realm. The idea, it's like another way of achieving immortality using technology. Yes. The themes of immortality in, in all kinds of writing about the technological singularity all over the place. So I guess my big starter question would be given our current technology, are we at any risk of a technological singularity within the next decade? So in terms of uploading our brains into the computers, uh, I don't think so. Um, we are not really at that stage of understanding of how the human mind or, or even the mouse mind or whatever is being studied. I don't think we're at that level of understanding uh, in order to be able to do that. And I don't think we will be in the next 10 years. Now, th there is some debate about that. Uh, it it's believed that um, 
you know, with sufficient resolution of like MRIs or whatever, you could map out, you know, every single nanometer slice of brain in perhaps more like in a mouse, because we would really need a lot more computer power to do this with a larger brain. Um, and you could theoretically put that together into some sort of simulation. But uh, I think even that is very, very far-fetched uh, for the next 10 years. Not to say that AI isn't going very interesting places. Um, and I also think that the other side of it, that's, that's more the artificial creation, you know, like the, the HAL from 2001, A Space Odyssey. I also think that is probably not likely in the next 10 years. So what I'm saying is a self-aware AI, because again, self-awareness is not a well understood concept of what are the mechanics of it? What does it even really mean, right? How do we, how do we go from neurons firing to the sensation of, I feel like I am in this body, in this room, communicating with you and you know, in front of me on this screen, that experience, how does it go from neurons firing, which, you know, an individual neuron, very simple, relatively simple, at least relatively understandable, put a bunch together and suddenly we're experiencing reality. Like, wow, that's profound. Well, how mm -hmm. does that work? Well, and I, I, I think a lot about how humans or people and the ability to identify sentience or self-awareness and other creatures, let alone robots or things that we've designed. I'm seeing all these studies constantly going, are I'm kind of making this up as I go because I can't remember the exact article at the time, but like ducks are sentient. And I'm like, well, I've, I've always felt like ducks have had their own, <laughs> like, you know, quality of life and that they, you know, can think and, you know, just because they're not us doesn't mean that they don't have self-awareness. So I always find it really interesting when humans are the deciding factor on what is considered self-aware and what is considered sentient, let alone an object that we then create. And I think it's really interesting you're talking about AI and has AI reached um, self-awareness because we have had some examples of AI and I want to go into what does AI currently, you sent me a video about picture uh, compilation or, or something where they are able to create photos from uh, words that you provide the computer, photos that have never seen in real life that they can make something out of nothing. And right now I'm actually seeing AI photography take off on TikTok. People are, you know, using it to say, this is what I looked like in a past life, you know, stuff like mm. that. So is that kind of the extent of AI now? What is that when AI is generating these images? Yeah. So um, what you're talking about is this text prompt to image conversion software. And uh, one of them is, I think the most uh, well-known right now is called DALL-E. And it's like a play on Wally -E and like Salvador Dali. And what you have in this system, and I don't understand all of the technical details of it, but what you have is state of the art artificial intelligence that is being trained on a massive amount of uh, image data that is presumably also tagged, uh, labeled in some way, right? So uh, at some point, presumably a human said, you know, this is a picture of a stop sign, and this is a picture of a school bus, and this is a picture of whatever. And it's trained on all that data. And then and it's not just this is a picture of a school bus, but like this is a picture of a school bus that is driving along a rural road. There is a field with sheep in the background. I'm mm -hmm. making this up, but that's the idea. So there's relationships that are described as well. And you train the system on all this data. And then you put in a, a prompt. So you write in your text and the intelligent system has all of these associations and it has all of its own um, attributes that it has learned about these images. And then it can start to create an image based on what it knows and what you prompted it with. 
and and some of these are really wild because like so for example from an article i was looking at somebody put in the prompt cthulhu on sesame street Mm -hmm. and you know i'll be darned if the images aren't there's the cast of sesame street and you know sitting next to cookie monster is what looks like a fuzzy cthulhu you know uh there's one somebody put in paddington bear moshing at a metal concert and (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome the image that that paints in your head is very much what these things are generating, which is a wild, a wild thing because it really gives you the impression that there's some degree of understanding there. Mm-hmm. What I thought was really interesting as the video went on was how something that seems so simple as prompt generation could be harmful um based off of the algorithms and what could um what could be generated as a result of you know a reflection of society can you go into that a little bit for a long time i think people were saying things especially around self-driving cars people were saying things like oh you know all the truckers will be out of work but not me my job is creative no one could do what i could do right (laughs) (laughs) and uh, i think that more and more we're seeing that you know there are very few jobs that are off limits to uh, this sort of technology um certainly this particular technology that we're discussing um very much a a a threat to artists especially independent artists who are trying to make their living um you know i see interest you know i'm on twitter like like we were saying we we connected on twitter Uh, especially you know, the indie author community, people working on really tight budgets and want a cover. And, and I write science fiction. So, you know, I'm, I'm tuned into that area. And so they want their interesting sci-fi cover. Well, here's an extremely cheap way to potentially, I mean, in some senses free, but you can pay for like more services on these. Anyway, I don't know all the business model of how they're doing this, but, but I mean that right there of even just these small, uh creators writers in this case and then also the artists saying like well you know instead of paying so much for an artist i'm going to use this very cheap ai generate my cover and and right there that's that's taking away money from flesh and blood uh artists and and beyond and that's just like sort of the i don't know maybe the most obvious way in which this can be harmful to people but there's a lot beyond that um so there's this saying garbage in garbage out and i think it was originally like a statistics um saying but ai in many respects is statistics on steroids and so the idea of garbage in garbage out is that when you train your model or you run your statistics on bad data you get bad results Mm -hmm. and bad doesn't mean inaccurate uh so for example um i don't remember exactly how long ago this was i feel like it's just last couple years but then of course covid makes last couple years Mm -hmm. is that like five years or ten years or one um but in any case recently uh amazon got in trouble because they were running an ai recruiting tool that uh was basically rejecting um minority uh and i believe black in particular but i was rejecting minority applicants basically and the ai was not being malicious the ai itself i mean you could say it's racist but like it's not somebody like wrote code saying like oh well you know if they listed their ethnicity as whatever then reject them um it was that it was trained on data where humans had been practicing racist recruiting like people were rejecting these applicants and the ai just learned to do the same thing so, so it's like children impressionable children it's very it's very much uh, a lot of times with these ais there's a very good analogy to be made to parenting i think and just dumping in all the data you have to train them is not good parenting right it's it's mm-hmm. the same as like here, kid, 
here's the TV and here's the remote, you know, go crazy or, or, you know, more modern, here's the internet, you know, just Mm -hmm. search whatever you want. Like that's not how one (laughs) would prefer to raise a child, I think, but that's kind of what is happening sometimes with the AI. If you're not careful. Yeah. Social bias that's built into the construction. What I thought was what, what always comes to my mind is how AI, and this is moving away from, uh, prompt generation, I guess you can say, but how AI can be used on social media as a negative. I've become so hyper vigilant now whenever I see certain hashtags go viral because AI, I'm reading that AI can be used to push for virility. And I think one good example actually that came to light was the Snyder cut for the Justice League, how he was using software to bring awareness to release the Snyder cut to help build that initial momentum. And then eventually it it got, it cuts on so much, you know, um, fire that they were able to actually release the Snyder cut. And I think about how this same idea can be used for any purpose. I know uh, a common one that I hear about is uh, in marketing, like the Kardashians being able to use uh, social media posts from like dummy accounts or uh, like army bots uh that ai is used to generate their content the amber heard uh johnny depp trials another good example where i saw a huge change in the social media environment once she hired a new pr team and how they were able to use uh social media as like a a battleground for introducing doubt and then you talk about russian involvement for any of our elections and how ai uh, is simply the tool that's used to create chaos and feed into some of our insecurities or even just you know salacious content that that builds interest my brain is so fuzzy so i'm trying to get my thoughts out as clearly as possible i hope that made sense (laughs) i I understand that completely um i was looking at some of my notes on the topics of these and could feel myself digressing even as i'm just reading my own (laughs) notes but it's welcome Uh, feel free yeah, absolutely. So um, let's talk about let's talk more about biases. Um, recently, Google made the news when Google engineer Blake Lemoyne claimed that their AI called Lambda was sentient. And this kind of blew up and everyone was kind of freaked out reading the transcripts. But then it was followed up with claims about his character of religious fanaticism, supposedly that may have impacted his actual findings. So how do we know when you kind of talk about human influences, when we've actually left the realm of human projection and reached actual AI sentience? Yeah, I I don't think anyone has a good answer to that question right now because we don't have a good definition of sentience. And as we sort of were talking about, projection is very strong, at least on an emotional level, right? Um, You know, human young children can have like a plush toy and be like, oh yeah, no, it it talks and it has its own thoughts and feelings, right? Very easy to project. Um, Even perhaps, you know, I mean, a kid wouldn't call it self-awareness, but but something akin to that, onto something like that. And adults do the same thing. And we don't really have a good understanding of what self-awareness the mechanism is. I mean, there's some theories that there's kind of a, a, a cat chasing its tail phenomenon going on where part of your brain is observing neuron activity in another part of your brain and can sort of form judgments about that. And, and then I I don't know the neuroscience, but then presumably some other part of your brain can look at that reflection. And sort of, you can reflect on your own reflection, right. And you Mm -hmm. can sort of go deeper and deeper into this uh, self-awareness and I can sort of communicate that experience um, but how it happens in my head, I have no idea. You don't know if I'm totally faking. I'm just a really good imitation of <laughs> a human or of a self-aware being. Um, you are AI this whole time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Descartes was very interested in this question. Like this is not a new, this is not a new question, right? I, I you know, he says, I think therefore I am, but all you zombies could be faking it for all I know. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I think that it, it's a really phenomenal question of self-awareness. I'm actually kind of, I read um, 
actually, even before I reached out to you, one of the, one of the reasons I, I thought this was a great topic was I read a book uh, called The Technological Singularity by um, Murray Shanahan. And I found the parts about how little we know about self-awareness to be really fascinating because I think too often um, modern science and understanding is presented as knowing a lot more than it does. And I think this is an area where we really don't know a lot. It is very much a frontier of uh, scientific discovery. Um, and so I think the self-awareness question is really fascinating. Uh, I think that the question of being truly self-aware versus really faking it is very fascinating. Um, but that practically it's, well, I don't know if it's easy to fake, but practically we don't have any measure of real self-awareness versus faking other than sort of our gut. Mm -hmm. Does this feel real? Like when we see the uncanny valley of animation and we get that weird gut feeling that it's not real. We know it's not real, it's animation, but when it dips too close into reality that we're uncomfortable now. Sure. And I mean, talking about gut feelings, um, a lot of the deep fakes, these uh, videos where, you know, they put some celebrity's face on somebody else or uh, whatever, a lot of those, in my opinion, pass the gut check. And like, I, I, you know, I have to check the comments and be like, is this, is this real or is this mm -hmm. fabricated? Yeah, I saw one recently. There's a guy that's really known, well known for doing the Tom Cruise deep fakes, and he started collaborating with Paris Hilton. And I did a double take because I was watching the video, and I'm like, "What?" And then someone pointed out, and they said, "Tom Cruise isn't that tall." I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, true," because he was towering over Paris, and Paris, I think, is like five eleven. So I was <laughs> like, "My gosh!" Like my own gut did like failed me in that case. Do you think? Yeah. If we were to actually come across true a true self-aware autonomous program that we would be okay with its existence oh no <laughs> um i mean there would be a variety of responses i'm sure but i think we would most people many people very uncomfortable with the idea of a self-aware autonomous program and I think one distinction that you kind of need to make is sort of the origin of, and a lot of science fiction and the origin of this stuff is like brain upload, because I think it's a relative, like I can say the word brain upload and a lot of people know what I'm talking about, even though it doesn't exist as a real technology, right? So a human uploaded into a machine is also, I think, uncomfortable uh, and raises a ton of questions. Um, but I think it's worth distinguishing that from like somebody wrote code and the code is saying, no, 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 I'm self-aware. Don't unplug me. You know, is it because we see ourselves in the brain that's uploaded? Yeah. 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 For sure. I, I would say so. Uh, I think that being able to be like, oh, thank goodness. It, it has a human origin. It doesn't originate as something I don't understand. You know, the programmer is in his dark room scribbling, strange symbols into the computer and, and that's where this came from interesting because if you think about like human nature in general i'm not saying this is all humans but there is a tendency for some people when they have children um you have more narcissistic personalities that only just see their children as extensions of themselves and versus being their own autonomous individual person um and I find that to be kind of like a similar approach. Like some people might be okay if they're dealt with an actual autonomous person the same way they might be acceptable of other people that are, you know, not an extension of themselves. But people who struggle with seeing others as being individuals may will definitely not like any sort of AI, you know, program that is in, independent of them. I, I think there's just also, you know, that, that hu at least a human is understandable. Right. At least at least we understand what the human wants and, and needs and things like that. Um, whereas I think for a lot of folks, code is code is nebulous. Um, there was a there was a, a, a phrase that I, I knew I wanted to look up in advance of this uh, for. 
and I, I Googled it as like understandable AI. And I actually quickly found what I was looking for. So it's sometimes called explainable AI. XAI is, is sometimes the, the shorthand or simply um, white box AI, which is distinguished from black box AI. So um, white box AI, you can run it uh, in whatever scenario you have image recognition. It's in a self-driving car or whatever, right? And it can report, I see a stop sign or I don't. And the white box, you know, transparent box is sort of more what they're going for there. You can investigate. You can say, okay, AI, you made this decision that you see a stop sign. What's that based on? And it'll say, oh, well, the probability that uh, I is high because I saw red and I saw an octagon and the joint probability of those things. Uh, it, it tells me that very high probability that it's a stop sign. And it's mostly statistics, kind of like I said, but there's also black box AI where yes, of course a human wrote it. And of course there are um, theories and such by way, by how we understand these things. Um, neural networks are the example I'm getting at. But a neural network, which is also, by the way, a simulation of an organic brain, basically you you put the data in one end and there are all these, what do I want to say here? I'm going to say trigger points. There are all these thresholds. That's the word. There are all these thresholds. And you know each neuron might be looking at just one pixel of the image. And if that pixel... Uh, is of a certain value that triggers the threshold, the neuron will fire and that passes along to further neurons and they fire or don't fire. And then at the very end, there's some single neuron that either fires or doesn't. And that's like yes to a stop sign or no to a stop sign. And you can't interrogate that thing. You can't ask it, well, how did you decide that this was a stop sign, right? Because there's no probabilities. Uh, it was trained on certain data and you could look at the training set, but you can't, you can't ask it. Well, like, how'd you make your decision? Because it, it can't reflect on that. It's a very intelligent AI. I mean, neural nets are used in, uh, they're an aspect of the uh, text to image. They're an aspect of most image recognition. They're used widely, but you can't ask them the question. Of, how do you know that is the right answer or how did you reach that conclusion interesting that makes me th a friend of mine has a tesla and one of the things he showed me because with this i guess this i don't have a tesla so i'm just going off of what i'm seeing in his videos there's a screen and it can read what i know people take their teslas to like graveyards and then they whenever a little body figure pops up on the screen they say that the tesla is reading ghosts but <laughs> the tesla is supposed to be able to read what's ahead of you <clears throat> and um you know act accordingly uh, like if there's a dog that runs across the street and being able to break check for that. But in this case, there was a police on a segway on a Segway in the parking lot of a shopping mall and the car read it as a motorcycle. And of course, mm -hmm. that's inaccurate. The cop on a Segway is not going to go as fast as a motorcycle. And it makes me wonder, does the Tesla have different programming for a motorcycle than what would have been more appropriate for a Segway? Um, mm -hmm. And that was a really good example of saying, well, the Tesla doesn't actually know. It just programs to the best that it can based off of what the code was. Yeah, that uh, is a really interesting way you phrase that of Tesla doesn't know. Um, and, and maybe they'd argue that point. But like, if they're using a neural net, I think it's a fair statement to say they don't necessarily know. Um, and this gets into, I mean, we've already seen this as a weird thing that crops up every once in a while of like the responsibility when something goes wrong, mm -hmm. where does responsibility lie? And, you know, part of the technological singularity idea is that beyond this point, uh, when, when people say like beyond the singularity, all bets are off and everything changes. When they say everything, they mean like socially, legally, morally, like it goes on and on and on. And I think legally right there, it, we're already seeing that, things get weird. Um, the explainable AI, one of its um, purposes, one of its uh, reasons that it needs to be distinguished and that it's important is for legal reasons, 
for something AI oriented to be admissible in a courtroom setting, you have to be able to figure out how it made the decision that it made. What's that based on? Um, I mean, I would assume so. I, I'm sure maybe there's other, I'm not a lawyer and, and I don't know where they would go with, with such things. And I think many lawyers don't know either because it's such a new technology. But there is that unknown, I guess is what I'm saying. The technological singularity, if we have reached that point and gone beyond, does that mean fuzzy gray areas like this will no longer exist? Are we, is this the weird transferal stage that we're in right now? So uh, to, to give my personal opinion, I think that the technol I don't think there will be a technological singularity. I think there will be a technological fuzz or whatever word you use, a, a technological gradual change. And I think that we are very much in such a thing. Um, I think that even pointing at the, you know, we talked about the bots, the you know, Russian bots and other bots and, and manipulating social media algorithms. That is people writing code to manipulate some other algorithm because that other algorithm is so impactful in mm -hmm. impacting humans and influencing people. And so you have this AI, I mean, to be dramatic, you have an AI war going on where you have these, not that the bots are very sophisticated, but like you do have a bunch of these little AI bots trying to manipulate this other algorithm mm -hmm. that is learning, is trying to learn how to mostly gather people's attention and, and keep people's attention. I think that is the scariest part. I work for an organization. I'm sure many organizations have to deal with like bot attacks and how over the years they've gotten more and more sophisticated. But uh, I also learned that have you ever gotten one of those emails that's clearly spam because they mispronounced something or misspelled something and you're like spam and you delete it. But I found out like, I was like, why aren't they getting better at that? I found out that they are purposely making things misspelled because they don't like they want, if you, if you can be fooled, then they know that they'll fool you and even more to mm. giving them more money. So they're looking for that person who doesn't catch on, um, to just like common misspellings and weird, like language issues, because then they're more likely to also be the ones to hand over their bank account numbers or do the gift card scam situation. I was like, that's interesting. Because then you have to think about, all right, naturally you would think they would get better and better and more sophisticated and they would fool even um, the smartest of us. But then you realize that they have programmed an, like human error into it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. does that require a human to understand that shortcoming? You know what I mean? Like how, how are we able to like think about our own shortcomings to be able to take advantage of us? Would we always need a human to be able to like consult for that? <laughs> Yeah, you actually made me think of um, this really interesting talk that I heard. I believe it's still on YouTube. Uh, if anybody wants to search it, it's something like The Most Human Human. And it was a talk given at the Santa Fe Institute um, years ago. I don't remember exactly when. And the speaker is talking about his experience uh, in a... Um, a Turing competition. So um, Alan Turing, famous mathematician and computer scientist. And the Turing test mm -hmm. is this idea he came up with of, well, <clears throat> if you can interact, and the test is usually just purely through text. If you can interact with a computer through text and a human through text, and you can't tell which is which, then the computer passes the Turing test and is for all intents and purposes, I don't know exactly, not human, but is intelligent, I think is, is the main thing. Okay. And um, he talks about how he made a response to some particular question. And in his brain, it was like, oh, haha, ha, I'm going to do like a quirky response. And it like makes sense to me. But to the person he was talking to, it came off as a non sequitur. And the person was like, mm, nope, not not a human. And so there's this weird balance that we all strike between being very, very stiff and formal and machine-like and being sort of our quirky selves. And his thing talked a lot about um, security and how uh, 
a lot of our security is is really just terrible, right? Uh, somebody, and this is this is going way back, but somebody hacked um, Sarah Palin's email when she was running uh, as the vice presidential candidate, um, and they managed to do it simply by reading her Wikipedia page and submitting a "Hey, I forgot my password" on her email, and then just you know the the questions were like, "Where did you go to high school?" And that's all public, well, easily accessible information. And so the only thing that the hacker had to figure out was the idiosyncrasy of how she typed it in. Does she say, I think it was Wasilla, I think. I, I kind of vaguely remember the, the name of the school. But like, did she say, you know, WHS? Did she say Wasilla High? Did she say Wasilla High School? Did she capitalize it? Did she lowercase it? And that quirk was the only part that was stopping him and every other hacker from, you know, getting, getting uh, into her emails. And so there is this aspect of humans are imperfect. And I do, I do find it interesting that AI is sort of mimicking our imperfection in order to better imitate us. And I think that's really the fascinating part about this whole conversation and the technological singularity and everything is that, it, it, it is human centric, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's going to be brains in boxes, uh, it, it, certainly not AI brains in boxes, and it probably not even human brains in boxes, but it's going to be stuff that is connected to human quirks and foibles and all the things that we're already vulnerable to just more so. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me appreciate my quirks even more. <laughs> Laws. As since we are both writers, um, and this entire podcast is towards fiction, I thought it'd be great to talk about how self-aware artificial intelligence has been used in science fiction novels and movies. So what are some good examples of this? What are some recommendations we can give to our listeners? Um, well, the one that, and again, I, you know, I guess it's an artificial intelligence, but it's more of like the brain upload stuff. So the brain upload kind of phenomenon that I think is really well done and I really enjoyed is Altered Carbon. Um, I, I devoured all three of the books. Um, I, I loved the first season uh, on Netflix. I haven't watched the second season. I heard it's not as good, but whatever. Um, the books and the movie, I think, do a really interesting job showing how this one particular technology, being able to put the brain, put the human mind on a machine and then and very importantly, be able to download that into different human bodies has all of these effects on society, um, socially, legally. Uh, there's religious stuff, especially in the first book um, and in the show itself, which is basically following the first book. Uh, all kinds of that stuff. It, he, he really looks at the author. Um, did I say the author's name? What is the author's name? Anyway, it doesn't doesn't matter. Altered Carbon. It's it's well known. Morgan. Morgan is the guy's last name. Looking it up. Altered Carbon book. Richard Morgan. Richard Morgan. So he does a great job of, you know, telling I think a good story, and also showing just every facet of this technology. Um, I think. You know, you could argue it's not a technological singularity because, like, it's relatively understandable. But I think that that's kind of a uh, an unfair. Like, yes, the technological singularity has oh, things will be completely different in its definition, but you can't write that story, right? You got to connect to the the readers in our, from our perspective, our experience. So you can't go so off the deep end that we don't get it. Yeah. And so I really enjoy Alter Carbon as one of them. That's okay. one example. I've been really fascinated by how science fiction writers and storytellers use uh, technology to explore romance and, and love situations, um, especially when you talk about people that are lonely. I, I know that like in the in the age of dating apps, I see it seems like there's a lot of people that are just so frustrated. I, I remember there have been books that have come out about how people, you know, it's like you always swipe. There's always another person mm. with the next swipe. So the idea that um, nothing really feels meaningful, I guess you can say. And so what 
what would the natural next step be is finding that perfectly curated presence that that meets your every needs. And so there's two examples that I saw for that. One is Her, starring Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson, where he uses an actual program that's designed to be like your partner and he ends up falling in love with her and all he has really is a voice. And then you have the Blade Runner 2049 movie with Joy, who is uh, a, a digital projection, I guess, is the best way to describe her. And she's supposed to be the perfect woman for you. And I thought it was uh, played by Ana de Armas, who I love very, very much. And um, even though the main character, I don't think is an actual human, I'm not the most <laughs> knowledgeable of the Blade Runner. Uh, That's OK. I movies. actually watched Blade Runner 2049 Okay. in between now and when we scheduled this. <laughs> what did you think? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. I was super impressed. Um, and, and Joy, in particular, that storyline, I thought was so well done in leaving enough room for interpretation. And I think it's a great discussion. Like people could discuss Joy and you could have a whole podcast on that sort of, you know, how they played that out and different people's opinions on how real it was, what that means and all kinds of stuff there. I thought, I thought it was great. Fantastic. Um I thought, I mean, that's the one part that I take away and always think about, after, you know, years after having watched it before. Um, the idea that in both circumstances with her and Blade Runner 2049, you have this curated girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. And then it calls into question, like, what is a meaningful connection for humans and at what length are they willing to go to find it? And, you know, just exploring human loneliness in general. So that was one of my examples. Do you have any more examples? So I, yeah, I, I could talk even more about that, I'm sure. The, the human loneliness, and, and I think that's a very relevant um, modern topic for us, you know, because of like the dating apps and the social media as well. And, you know, being encouraged to form these connections with people that you don't really know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that you, you've never met in the flesh. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have a, so another, Another really, so Altered Carbon is very noir. It's very dark. Um, and so <laughs> contrasting that rather a lot, uh, I think, is actually a webcomic uh, called Dresden Kodak. And it is uh, both am amusing in many of its storylines and also a lot more positive and optimistic about uh, the technological singularity. Um, and so the main character is this human cyborg and she's uh, socially awkward and just has a terrible time fitting in. She is, she wants to be just like the, the stereotype of the isolated focused scientist. Right. Um, and of course that can't happen. You know, she's, she's pushed into all these situations where she has to interact with people and on all these other things, but it's, it's much more, um, looking at the technological singularity in a positive light. And I, I have, so, so a word that's used in, in regard to this is transhumanism, where it's sort of people are changing from the, the flesh and blood that they're born with to becoming something different and something more. And a lot of people who are proponents of transhumanism say like, this is what we've always been doing, right? You and I are both wearing glasses. Um, so we're enhancing, uh, or we're making up for deficiencies, uh, that we've developed. Right. And, uh, you know, I've had braces. Most people have had braces. I still have the little metal bar under the, you know, bottom set of my teeth, whatever, all these, all these different things. Right. And so transhumanists sort of say, well, that's already happening. So like having, you know, a cybernetic arm or a chip in your brain is, not that much further it's it's certainly on the spectrum it's on a gradation rather than like oh no now we've really crossed the line and i think one of probably the more famous dresden kodak web comics is called uh it's called like caveman science fiction if you search dresden kodak and kodak is c-o-d-a-k um you'll you'll find that and it's basically sort of a counter argument to the many 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 science fictions that are like 
oh no, don't take science too far. Like Jurassic Park is a classic example of, right, of, you know, Ian Malcolm saying, your scientists were so obsessed with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to ask whether or not they should, right? And um, as I was, I was looking back at, at Dresden Kodak, because I knew it was something I, I maybe wanted to talk about for this, there was a quote that I came across, which was, I thought, um, really impactful, which was, um, preserving your flesh does not automatically preserve your humanity. Guarding your humanity is on you. And I really liked that as a, just because you're modifying yourself, that doesn't make you less human. And having the opposite, having not modified yourself, doesn't make you more human. Right? It doesn't, doesn't give you any more compassion or empathy than anybody else. And so that's, it's a very interesting one. Sometimes it's very hard to understand. If anybody sort of gets into it, I recommend not worrying about so much if you're totally understanding what's going on and just kind of enjoy the ride. <laughs> That's how I feel about watching Westworld right now because they've explored some, I, I believe, I feel, I think, because I just finished the last episode. I'm, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but <laughs> There's some transhumanism in there. It starts off with, um, you know, artificial intelligence robots that are hosts of a theme park and humans can go into the theme park and, basically express them their every humanly desires on these robots you know murder them you know pr promiscuity all that kind of stuff in this wild west town and the whole point of the show is you know the robots are they get sick of it they reach they seemingly see reach self-awareness they wage war against the humans but at a later part in the show they discover that they can download the human's brain into a robot and they do a series of tests they're called the Delos tests. The company that runs the whole thing is Delos. And um, every time they test, the human brain rejects the robot body. And whether it's like, like once they become self-aware, like if, as long as they continue to live in the dream state of their memories, or they fooled into thinking that everything is fine, then they're fine. But the minute the veil is pulled away and they're like, look, you're actually a robot, then the brain goes into like meltdown mode and everything fails. So, I think I said that right. If someone listens to Westworld and knows better, please tell me because I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so then what are some common plot devices or narrative structures that usually come with writing a technological singularity story? So um, I'm going to springboard off of the Westworld comment oh, and, yeah, and hopefully it. also answer that one, yes. which is, <clears throat> so I, obviously the, the AI gets fed up with being our slaves and revolts against us is sort of a, a very, very common uh, trope. Um, and I think that's not quite as interesting as the later part of what you were describing in Westworld. I've not seen Westworld, where you were talking about how the brain, once it learns of sort of what it's become, rejects the, the robot body. Um, and I think that the sort of, question of what makes us human and identity i mean that's this this is you know philip k dick explores identity and, and what what makes someone human i mean obviously he's the author of what blade runner is based on but um explores that in great detail and i think that you always have to bring it back to how does this reflect um on humanity i really love actually the existential crisis sort of okay. uh <laughs> trope um it reminds so uh the author Werner Vinge and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly has a novel A Fire Upon the Deep and um I do like a lot of his work and some of it I, I don't care for but in A Fire Upon the Deep one of my favorite parts is that one of these very very powerful presumably once human beings but has like transcended through technology into this much greater thing um creates a human at one point uh, to do his bidding, right? And the human finds out about this and has this total existential crisis meltdown um, and says something to the effect of they create machines like us, talking about humans. And it was a very powerful, like, this guy has had, you know, the veil ripped away and has seen 
<laughs> seen into himself and, and not seen a soul and not seen free will. And is, is this really terrible moment for this character? Um, I, I, th I don't know how often I've seen that particular thing used, but I really did like that one in A Fire Upon the Deep. So I wanted to mention that one. Um, other common tropes, I think, uh, you know, we mentioned immortality. Mm -hmm. Immortality, I think, is a huge one because once you're able to upload a mind to a format that doesn't decay or doesn't decay as quickly or a format where you could copy it freely, um, immortality is one of the first things that we think of. Um, do you think in the process of uploading yourself that it's a for you your own pov is that like a smooth transition or do you just hmm. stop existing and your digital self continues right so and i'm not thinking i'm not having immediate examples of that in my head but i know that science fiction has explored that topic um there's sort of a couple ways to go about it uh one is, of course, you know, it's always dramatic to have sort of a painful transition, right? You know, the transition in the Matrix, you know, it doesn't look comfortable for Neo. Um, but uh, another interesting way to go about it is suddenly there is very much two of you, right? It's convenient if the upload process is sort of destructive. It's convenient if it destroys the original, because then there's not two of you. And now, like, you know, anything you legally owned who owns it do you both own it is it joint property now like what's what's the deal with that um altered carbon definitely takes the approach of now and there's like all kinds of legal structure in the in the the story world uh, around it but like yeah potentially there's two of you but one of you has to die like that's like the legal requirement <laughs> um <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah right and uh, so, but yeah, that's, that's like a, a major thing of, of how does that process go? Is it smooth? I think that you have to consider that the brain is not a passive organ. You know, we sleep, but that is not the brain turning off. It's the brain functioning differently, but it is like in, in progress, right? You shut the brain down and like, you have a dead person. You don't have a person that you can very easily then just start right back up. So um, I don't know. I like to see when when that's acknowledged in you know the sort of brain upload science fiction that that you have to do this as an active state. Um, I saw yeah. a black. Uh, there's a Black Mirror episode that has the brain upload concept, but only reserved for those near death. So mm -hmm. what happens is if you are like cancerous and you're like only oh, like, months away, you get like a special, you know, uh, trial period where you can upload your brain into this digital afterlife that can be outfitted however you want it to be. Let's say you grew up in the 80s and so you find yourself in the 80s, you can jump decades, everything is outfitted for these special needs. And then once you reach death, you can choose before you die in, in your will, if you're going to die a peaceful human death, or if you are going to get your brain uploaded into this digital afterlife. And so what ends up happening is everyone, it's like a network, it's like the internet, you can meet people in there, and then you can decide you know, to spend the rest of that, your entire afterlife with them if you both die around the same time, which I thought was like a sweet way, a, a nice way of looking at brain uploads and kind of solving the problem of what to do with the body because the body's dead anyway. Yeah, right. It's kind of, that's a, probably an author like, oh, this is convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> solve that problem. <laughs> I, I do like the, um, and I think there's a ton of um, sort of religious uh, connotation and, and perhaps implication as well. Like the idea that this is sort of an afterlife type thing. Um, people have definitely compared the technological singularity to uh, the rapture. I saw online that it's called sometimes the nerd rapture. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up. That's <laughs> Yeah, that's and that's a derogatory. Uh, that's a derogatory term for sure. But they should you know, call it the rapture with a P P rap app it's an app get it oh rap. nice sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh that would be good for like for a marketing uh-huh yeah for marketing We're gonna copyright yeah. that no one steal that all right <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I was thinking too of the religious stuff. I put down crisis of ex- existentialism, playing God, um, the idea that if you can live on eternally, do, do, would you automatically? And I would. I would think the answer is yes. Think that you're better than other humans who have not had access to that. Are we going to see a diff- a socioeconomic divide between people with access to the technology and those who don't? Yeah. So the the nerd rapture thing, I mean, is used as to, to raise that point of who actually gets access to the singularity, right? And I very much think that the use of nerd there is not pointing at, uh, you know, you and me who are, you know, <clears throat> I assume not raking in, you know, the dough, <laughs> but more pointing at nerds like Bill Gates mm-hmm. and Elon Musk and to a certain extent, Jeff Bezos. Um, those nerds nerds with means Uh, as it were capital n nerd yeah yeah if you like (laughs) because there is that question of well well who gets access to this um so i actually should we should have mentioned this name earlier um uh kurzweil and i think that's how it's pronounced it's like k-u-r-z-w-e-i-l um so he was like the first and, and biggest proponent of this idea and he like really thought like yeah we should pursue this like people should live forever like let's make this happen and i believe it can happen you know talking about the singularity in particular um and when i've read his stuff which i don't have that much stomach for but i I have read at least a while ago um you know a big question that i always ask is so he's saying like you know here's extrapolations of computer technology computers are getting stronger faster you know more data packed into a smaller space and i always want to say okay power where and i mean electricity like where does that come from like Mm. because this is not a free thing i mean even you know the computers that we have consume a significant and growing proportion of like global energy production you know um where where does he think all this power comes from? I mean, this is often a problem with science fiction as well when we talk about, you know, loading up all kinds of resources and moving them into outer space. You know, that's that's also a very energy intensive uh, procedure. But one of the reasons that I'm skeptical of the way he imagines the singularity, just one of the reasons is, yeah, where does all this electricity come from? Yeah, I, I know that in Westworld they had a lot what they had the equivalent of their robot heaven which was like a huge server and the way they solved that for a very limited uh target audience was a dam but i'm like if you try to think about like all the people in the world that want to have access to it i just keep thinking like when you talk about you know capital n nerds when you think of the bezos of the world i'm like oh my gosh i absolutely think if technological singularity were a thing and we could up up upload our brains that the, the top one percent of the one percent would absolutely jump on that they could become our immortal uh deities <laughs> in the future one day and that's I, that's I, pretty much the premise of altered carbon you know they have a very scary line about uh death being the great equalizer you know nobody escapes death but now they do and these people that already own everything you know can you imagine that being worse than today well here it is. <laughs> that is very true. So then speaking of which, I have this next question. Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, and Bill Gates have all cautioned against artificial intelligence, claiming it presents an existential threat against humanity. What are your thoughts on this? Um, yes, but probably not in the same way that maybe they're thinking of it. Um, I think that artificial intelligence is an aspect of a multifaceted existential threat against humanity that is humanity itself uh that very much is a problem today it's not becoming a problem like it is a problem you know we talked about social media algorithms and frankly other news media as well people's beliefs and opinions are being manipulated um by inhuman forces uh in ways that's making it hard for society to confront climate change you know, to mention just perhaps the biggest existential threat. So as the AI is sort of a minion 
in in a broader uh, problem. Um, and I do not think that AI is evil in and of itself. You know, it gets back to garbage in, garbage out. Uh, what are you training it based on? And what are you training it to do? You know, we learned, not that this was a huge shocker for anyone who had ever looked at psychology, but, you know, we've learned in a much more immediate way than we really knew in the past that strong emotions sell and not even good emotions necessarily, mm -hmm. right? And like so- Like baby stuff, the stuff yeah, that just makes you react. Right, that just makes you react. So we've created artificial systems that have learned to make humans angry and other emotions. But, <laughs> you know, that's probably not what the founders of computer science were envisioning when they envisioned the future of their technology, you know? <laughs> That's such a good point. Well, that concludes all my questions. Have I left anything out? Or is there anything that you'd like to say? Um, I think that yeah, we've covered, I mean, we could talk about this all day. There's so many <laughs> facets of it. Um, I think that was very enjoyable. And, and I, yeah, I think we covered a whole bunch of good uh, topics there. Well, thank you, Neil, so much for being a part of the podcast. Um, do you want to promote your book one more time? Because it'll be out hopefully around the time this thing comes out. Yeah. And if I could also just briefly say, um, I am uh, Haste Writing on YouTube, that's H-A-S-T-E Writing. Uh, I talk about books and writing on there, if anybody wants to check that out. But yeah, the book Crew of Exiles is relevant to this topic. Um, there's a trope of these being, you know, humans that transcend being sort of arrogant and snobbish and, and you know, wearing togas that just glow with light and sort of that trope. And basically the book takes that trope and one of those individuals is exiled back into a human body from which they cannot escape. And they have to cope with that and hopefully also maybe learn a lesson or two about what it means to be human along the way. So that's, that's a synopsis of my book right there. And I think it's delightful and enjoyable and I hope people check it out. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.